Bună ziua! Scuzați-mă, nu vorbesc că mă românește foarte bine, so I'll speak in English. So why speak in praise of the ordinary? Well, I've been watching Ted here, I've been watching Ted videos at home, and often I believe that the person speaking on the stage is extraordinary. So if, just can I just take a poll? Please could you raise your hand if you thought this previous speaker was extraordinary? Yeah, I think all of us. While I believe that this is positive, I ought to believe it has some negative consequences unless we're aware of them. So a few years ago, I was directing a charity working with young people from diverse communities. And often, I would hear the, the cry, there's a lack of positive role models for these young people. I knew this wasn't true. I know people who are inspiring to me, just that they're not famous and their stories aren't told. So I asked one of these young teenagers that had been expelled from school. I said, who do you most admire? I was expecting Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, or somebody like this. Instead, I got Snoop Dogg. I followed it up with a question. Who do you most admire who's had the biggest impact on your life? Suddenly, the answer changed. He became my father, my mother, my sister, my brother, my best friend. Often the people who have the biggest impact on us are not celebrities, they're not high achievers, but they're the people closest to us in our lives every day. I decided to tell the stories of people I knew who are inspiring to me. They range from a hat maker, a health service manager, an architect, a delivery van business owner. Half the people were from my hometown and I related to them not because of their achievements, because of their ordinariness. I asked them to share, how did they become successful? What were the obstacles they faced in their life? How did they overcome them? I even found a co-author who told about his life story when he came to England from another country. Five years after I finished the book, I realized something was missing. What was missing was me. I found it so much easier to talk about the success stories of other people, to share and celebrate them, and not my own story. I had the belief, I haven't achieved anything extraordinary, therefore, I don't have anything of value to share. I share this not to be indulgent, but because I believe it's not only me in this room or watching this video that thinks they don't have anything to share. I believe that many of us struggle in placing value on our own story and honoring our own lives, which we may perceive as ordinary, especially after watching the last speaker. No, w when I was invited to speak, I noticed a temptation to seduce you into thinking I was extraordinary by listing all my achievements, you know, all the things that I have done, and maybe you'll accept me and think I'm worthy to stand on this stage. I think if they were altruistic in nature, even better because I think nothing is so good than an entrepreneur, but the only thing that's better in kudos is a social entrepreneur. I recently read an article, it was in a local newspaper, The Evening Standard, and it was by an author called Helen Curvin Taylor, and she talked about a new term called supers, which is used by recruitment people to describe high achievers. So these are people that when they're babies, you know, their mothers played to them accelerated learning language tapes, or they learn, um, listen to Mozart in the room. But it describes them as young adults who have worked in refugee camps in El Salvador during their gap years. You know, supers don't do frivolous gap years. They've done service learning in the slums of Mumbai, or they read books on string theory for fun. You know, the issue is that whether they're going for world domination or world improvement, there's a cost. Often they're not able to succeed in the complexity of the workplace or deal with failure. Altruistic aims can come sometimes be a cover for a deeper ego-centeredness, self-serving purpose, collecting her qualifications and serving others to cover an underlying inner restlessness. I can identify with this driving. I still spend much of my time traveling and being busy. And I wonder, what would happen if I stopped achieving, striving? What, would I, what do I avoid facing? in this business. There's a beautiful quote, it's by Blaise Pascal, he says, all the problems in the world arise 
from man's inability to be in a room by himself alone. There's a film um, I really love called American Beauty, where Mina Suvari turns to Kevin Spacey. She says, please don't tell me I'm ordinary. I want your approval. I want to be seen as unique, special, different, making a difference in the world. You know, Goethe, he said, everybody wants to be somebody. Nobody wants to grow. While the need for differentiation and striving is not pathological, we've seen many great speakers today, the danger is I can hide behind my accomplishments. And you relate to me primarily for what I have done rather than for who I am, a perfectly imperfect human being, worthy of respect and dignity, of intrinsic value. Joseph Campbell, the mythologist, he said, the privilege of a lifetime is being what you are. For me, there's a tension between grandiosity, here's a dictionary definition, and false humility, to owning our power our, and using our lives and gifts in service of others, recognizing our grandeur. Um, John Ruskin, he said, really great men have a curious feeling that the greatness is not in them, but through them. They see something divine in every other person. This is conveyed in a Sanskrit greeting from my own culture, South Asian culture, called Namaste. I'd ask you to just put your hands together like this. Namaste literally means in Sanskrit, I bow to you, but there's a deeper interpretation. It says, the divinity in me sees the divinity in you, recognizes the divinity in you. Surely the great speakers at TED today will inspire you, inspire other people. Well, our achievements, our sharing insights that change the world, may not necessarily inspire everyone, even if the audience is self-selected like Tedsters. They might create an idealization in which we view ourselves less favorably and feel our life is more dissatisfactory in meaning, contribution, and significance than it really is. If I have not um, created a new tech startup, if I have not made a portable fridge that has saved food for thousands of people, started a mobile school, or jumped from the highest mountain, is my life being wasted, or any less than yours? Speakers may help us aspire, but they could suggest we aspire to be someone else. You can see this in um, leadership and self-help literature, you know, advocating everybody to you know, lead just like Jack, or present like Steve, reference to the former CEO of GE or the late iconic Steve Jobs. Success is cast imitating the traits of other people. There's also the danger that we can become vicarious contributors to change in the world. If I have watched a TED talk about other people being creative or socially contributing, it might mean that I don't need to be creative. I don't need to serve other others. I think that in the very pursuit of being somebody, we may neglect those who are closest to us. We can disappear our relationships, neglect our own health and well-being. Now we need to only look at Facebook identities to imagine that everybody's traveling the globe, going to interesting cultural events, meeting their soulmate, or finding the, having the perfect baby, where the reality, when you meet them down the pub, is often very different. No mention of the loneliness, the relationship difficulties, the arguments with their work colleagues, or feeling unfulfilled, the difficulties of life that we all share, and I suggest make us all human. In his book, The Fear of Insignificance, Carlos Strenk argues that people have become commodities in the global infotainment system. Two models of the good life are presented to us and have become prevalent across the globe. Celebrity, the quantification of how well you're known, and financial success. So this is seen as how many hits do you have on Facebook if you put your name in? How many friends on Facebook? Or the opposite, no friends on Facebook, but you're a member of the exclusive network called the Small World Network. How much someone is worth is directly correlated to money. He's worth $1 billion. It doesn't sound so bad, except if you say he's worth $30. It doesn't sound so innocuous now. Quantification is seen as the only real form of value. I am ranked, therefore I am. Even artistic works and philanthropy are not positive in themselves, 
but for how many copies are sold? How many people did we impact? How many visitors attended? Often, we confuse living a life with having a career. We're pressured into l telling our lives as marketable CVs, you know, with titles we've acquired, positions we have held, and successes that were measurable. David Brooks, who writes um, the book, The Social Animal, he says that reading the New York Times wedding announcements sometimes sounds more like mergers between two companies and career paths than the union between two human beings. So in an age which glorifies the celebrity, we are fascinated by the mythic reenactment of the transformation of ordinary people to demagogue status. You can see this in the TV shows, X Factor, Idol, The Apprentice. Can we contemplate that telling people to reach for the stars may not be good advice? The philosophy of striving for the extraordinary may lead to the denigration of the ordinary and damage our self-esteem. Careers such as teaching, nursing, the professions, which were once seen as intrinsically valuable in themselves, are now seen as mundane, compared to those who achieve their 15 minutes of fame on Big Brother, or are famous for being famous. One of the keys that enabled me to relate to the diverse role models was that they revealed themselves what's and all. They didn't just tell me that they were successful, what they had done, they told me all of their failures, all the stepping stones, and they also shared how their life right now is not completely successful. There's costs. They owned their full experience. I sometimes think it's more difficult to be a complete human being than a saint. It means nothing can be excluded or suppressed. An example of this is a rocket scientist I interviewed. His mother had a mental illness. He grew up in a family where he was afraid, scared in his home, and he put himself into the interior life reading um, stories in the sci-fi comic books. It was a difficult situation, and he developed his imagination and fascination with rockets and space uh, that led him to design. I was touched that he shared his growth and his gift, not despite his suffering, but because of it. Often, I might appear to have a career. I often still, though, don't know what to do with my life. I'm training as a psychotherapist, yet I struggle. What's my purpose? Sometimes life feels empty. I write about connection, and yet sometimes I feel painfully lonely and disconnected. I recognize this contrast in nearly everybody I've met who is apparently extraordinary. Whatever you may be sure of, be sure of this, that you are dreadfully like other people. I saw a piece of graffiti once in Germany it said, you're one in a million, and the line underneath said, just like everybody else. So this summer, I was on a training um, group, and we had to describe what we were a commitment to in life. And I said, I wanted to be love, I wanted to be light, I wanted to make a difference in the world. And somebody said to me, Stephen, what does that look like? You know, can you bring it a bit more closer to home? So I changed my commitment from something out there some to something much more closer and specific, being a bit more compassionate and kinder to myself when I struggle. This was a profound shift to me, and although it might sound ordinary in its smallness, it was extraordinary in its impact. So perhaps the best way to make an impact is not to be extraordinary, but instead to focus on small acts. Ordinary Everyday moments can be miracles when we bring awareness to the present moment. Where I am, where I am, doing what I'm doing. This concept is described as mindfulness by, uh, by the Buddhists. When I delight in my senses, you know, scenes seem brighter. Whoops. Scenes seem brighter, food tastier, and music more effective. I can look for the first time without the label that desensitizes me to the wondrous moment. Even watching the reflection in a puddle, patterns the falling rain makes on the window, I used to call as a child a miracle moment. Life is a series of these moments, in and out, not um, staying on a total high all the time, which to me seems neither possible nor desirable. Often, these ordinary moments occur when we're alone, 
when we're not in the presence of others, when we're in solitude. My favorite object in the world is not an iPad 2. My favorite object in the world is a bench. I could sit for hours just observing nature, not having to move an inch, yet returning from that ordinary sitting, a renewed person. I believe that it's primarily in the ordinary way we make contact with each other and share experiences that life becomes extraordinary. Moments of human contact in relationship with each other, such as a smile, a gentle touch that can transform us. When I finished school, I volunteered for one year in an Alzheimer's disease unit, and I was asked to go away on holiday for one week with two men who had Alzheimer's disease. They were in their 50s. One was an RAF pilot, one was a police officer. And they were quite strong, um, tall men. And at night time, they would become confused. They would say, where's my wife? Who are you? And uh, sometimes become very disturbed. And I was, I was afraid. But one day, I just shaved one of the men. His name was Brian. And he turned around to me and gave me the biggest smile that you could ever imagine. You know, it was wordless. It was so ordinary, yet so extraordinary, that it stays with me forever. Another moment was when I was having fluid drained from my lungs. I went to the hospital by myself. My parents were working. And as I lay on the operation table, I just felt a gentle hand just touch my head and hold my head and just stroke gently the back of my head. I felt held. I never saw that nurse, but I'll never forget the gentle touch, the human contact. Virginia sat here. She says, and I suppose that before I leave the world, only one thing that I'd wish all the world to know is that human contact is made by the touch of skin, eyes, voice tone. These are the things that are taught to us before we had words. So I'd like to finish by concluding that the ordinary is underrated. Each so-called ordinary moment, whether alone or shared with others, is extraordinary. By striving to be extraordinary, we could miss the beauty, the value, and the wonder in all our everyday lives. I thank you for allowing me to share my story with you. And I'd like to end with a quote about from Einstein, who I believe spoke in praise of the ordinary as a way to live our lives. He said, the most beautiful experience we can have is the mysterious. He to whom this emotion is a stranger who can no longer pause to wonder and stand wrapped in awe is as good as dead. There are two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is as though everything is a miracle. Namaste.